Christless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree.
My name is Will Sykes. I'm part of the church family here um, and also a member of the staff team as part of the children's youth and families team. And it's great to be gathered here today as a church family on Mothering Sunday. Um, Perhaps we've got some visitors or people perhaps returning home for the weekend and uh, you're very welcome here. That's great wherever you've come from um, this morning. So this Sunday uh, is a special day for giving thanks for those who have been a motherly influence on our lives. And for some, day, uh, for some this will be a joyful day of celebration. Uh, for others, uh, this will be a day tinged with sadness. So we also uh, join together today to lift our eyes to Jesus, who is so committed to loving his people and into whose arms we can always run. So with this in mind, uh, some words are going to come up on the screen. And... Um, Hopefully, they're going to draw our eyes towards Christ. Um, So I'll read these for us. uh, And then the last four lines, they're going to be in bold. And if you can, then please join with me in saying those words. Jesus, like a mother, you gather your people to you. You are gentle with us as a mother with her children. Often you weep over our sins and our pride. Tenderly, you draw us from hatred and judgment. You comfort us in sorrow and bind up our wounds. In sickness you nurse us, and with pure milk you feed us. Jesus, by your dying, we are born to new life. By your anguish and labor, we come forth in joy. Despair turns to hope through your sweet goodness. Through your gentleness, we find comfort in fear. Your warmth gives life to the dead. Your touch makes sinners righteous. Together. Lord Jesus, in your mercy, heal us. In your love and tenderness, remake us. In your compassion, bring grace and forgiveness. For the beauty of heaven, may your love prepare us. Well, we're going to continue in praise of our God now by singing. Uh, We're going to sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. So if you're able to stand, please do, and let's sing together.
Amen. Please take your seats. The wondrous mystery is the good news of the gospel, and um, that leads me on to uh, a brief notice that I thought I'd share while we're all here together, and that's about a great opportunity to share the gospel um, with children and families from our community with the half-term football camp that um, is still a little way off, but it's not too early to, to get excited about it, and it's now not too early to sign up. You can sign up for that, and um, if you can, um, share uh, the, the invitation with people. Um, we've got lots of these flyers around. There are a load at the back. Um, so um, please do get excited about that and, and share if you can. Um, I'm wondering if, if there's anyone here who came to the football camp last year. I'm looking around. Yes, Toby, you were there. And Bethan, you were there. Um, Toby, can you, how, how did you find it? It was fun. Great. There you go. And that's the reason that you should all, all sign up to come. Um, it, it really doesn't matter how good you are at football. Uh, it doesn't even really matter how much you like football. Actually, there are lots of fun things that you can do. And there are all sorts of prizes as well that you can get for all sorts of different things. Um, and one thing that we can all do, which would be much appreciated, is um, to be praying um, that God would use this to make Jesus known to more and more of the children and families in our community. Um, speaking of Jesus, he's the focus of our Bible teaching this morning, and to help us uh, get thinking about the passage, the trainees have put together a video for us. Hello everybody, welcome back to The Betrainees. I'm your host, Jeff Jefferson, and we've come to the final. Two finalists are best friends. And they're going to compete to see who wins the 100 pounds. As this is the final round, Poppy and Amelia will get to choose whether to split the 100 pounds that they've won so far throughout the show, or whether one of them will betray the other and take it all for themselves. We've got some backstage footage of Amelia and Poppy before the show discussing what they're going to do. You know, I trust you so much. and. You know, it's really hard for me to say this, but I'm actually really, you know, struggling with money, as you know. And, and you've been with me through it all, but I just want to, you know, I know it's a, a lot to ask, but do you think we can split the money if we do, if we do win it? Of course, yeah. It would yeah. really make a big difference. Yeah, no, we're, yeah, we're, I would do that for you. We'll split, we'll split it. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is the final. We're at the part of the show where Poppy and Amelia, two best friends, get to choose whether to split the hundred pounds or to take it all for themselves. Amelia, what have you decided? Amelia's decided to split. Poppy, what have you decided? <gasps> Poppy's decided to steal. Poppy takes the whole hundred pounds for herself. Why would you do this? I thought we, I thought we agreed, Poppy. I trust in you. <sighs> wow, what a dramatic finish. I've never seen an episode of The Betrainees quite like that. Two best friends, and one of them betrays the other, takes it all for herself. Tune in next time for another episode of The Betrainees on Fullwood TV. Bye for now. Well, I was quite disappointed in Poppy there, weren't you? Yeah, you can all tell her later. No, in that, in that uh, all age video, Poppy went behind my back and she betrayed me, didn't she? And that was really, really sad. And today in this passage, we see that one of Jesus' best friends actually betrays him and that was really, really sad. But whereas I didn't know what was going to happen, Jesus actually knew what was going to happen. And we're going to see why he let that happen today. We're going to sing now. So if you'd like to come to the front and help me with the actions, then I'd love that. Thank you. <laughs> Let's stand and sing together.
Um, just while the kids go out, feel free to have a moment, turn perhaps to the person next to you and, and say hello. I'll just, uh, sorry, interrupt those conversations. <clears throat> um, please feel free to stay around at the end of the service and carry on those conversations and enjoy a cup of tea or coffee. Um, but for now, we're going to continue our service uh, with a time of prayer, and Alex is going to come and lead us. Thanks, Alex. Let's pray. Almighty God, we humbly come before you in prayer. As we look at the state of the world, it truly feels that creation is groaning. We see the evidence of global warming take effect and the human destruction that we have inflicted on your creation, and we are sorry. Show us how we can take personal responsibility to better care for the world you gave us. We read about the effects of war in Ukraine, Gaza, and elsewhere, and we despair at the human pain and suffering caused by human pride, greed, and retaliation. We cannot imagine what it feels like to be displaced or to live in constant fear and uncertainty. We thank you that you give us hope for now in the world that we live in and for the future in a new creation. You are God of the heavens and the earth, and one day you will wipe every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death, pain, or crying. Please give us the strength to endure until then, and thank you that you walk with us through it all. We pray for the leaders of our own country. We pray for men and women in positions of power who love you and who seek to be your hands and feet on earth. Please lift them up and give them wisdom to speak into difficult situations. Father God, we turn in prayer to our mission partners, Neil and Lucy, who pastor an international church in Central Asia and who will be returning to the UK this summer as their health isn't good. 
We, pray you for, we praise you for Moses, their new associate pastor from India, who now has his visa. We ask that you also provide his wife and son visas, and that you would smooth all other logistics and prepare their hearts as they make the significant move to serve you. Neil and Lucy have taken an unexpected holiday after being told to leave the country in order to apply for new religious licences. We pray for this to be sorted out as soon as possible and that Neil and Lucy will be available and have the energy to help Moses and his family adjust to Central Asia. We also pray for the church while Neil and Lucy are unable to be with them. Thank you that you will never leave them. And may this be a time of the church drawing closer to you. Lord, we stand in prayer with our partner church, St. Mary's Wombwell and St. George's Jump, and lift up to you John Armstrong, who leads this church. We pray for the four students from Cape and Ray Bible College who have come to do outreach in the church school and the various groups at church. We pray that you would bless them as they give their time and bless others through their work and witness. Lord Jesus, as we begin a new sermon series in the lead-up to Easter, we pray that your amazing rescue story will fill us with new wonder. We pray that we would be thinking about how we can communicate the significance of Easter with our non-Christian friends and family, and who we could invite to the church services or other events that are going on over this time. Finally, as many of us will be celebrating Mother's Day today, we thank you for the women who brought each of us into this world. We pray for those for whom this day may be difficult, whether through bereavement, a difficult or broken relationship, or because hopes of being a mum haven't been fulfilled. We thank you that you are a God of love who sees our pain and walks with us through it. We thank you that you formed each of us in our mother's womb, and that we are precious in your sight. And we thank you for all the very many ways in which this church supports mums, children, and families in our church and wider community. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Alex, for leading us in prayer. Uh, in a moment, we're going to hear... Uh, God's word to us as Paul German comes to read the Bible, and then Matt will come and set Christ before us. Um, but first we're going to sing again, and uh, this song that we're going to sing is called Consider Christ, and it encourages us to um, turn over and admire the beauty and goodness of Jesus. So let's stand and sing together as the band begins.
This morning's reading is from <clears throat> John chapter 18, the Gospel of John chapter 18, starting at verse 1. That's page 1086 in the Church Bibles. <clears throat> when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the betrayer was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you today. My name's Matt, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be starting off this new series in, uh, in John's Gospel, which we're going to do through to uh, Easter. Let's pray as we begin. Our Father in heaven, thank you very much for Jesus. Thank you for the account of him we get here in John's gospel. And as we consider it today and over the next few weeks, please stir our hearts with joy and faith and confidence in him, that he really is our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> How dark would things have to be for Jesus not to be able to keep us safe? Think about those darkest moments we face. We have an accident or we get sick, badly sick, and all joy is lost. Or when tragedy strikes, we lose a loved one far too soon, and it feels like there's nothing good in the world anymore. Or when we're facing our own death, and it's terrifying, even for those of us with faith. And we wonder, is Jesus still looking after me? It all seems too bleak. Or the darkness some of us experience in our minds, the clouds closing in, the, the relentless sadness, or the unpleasant thoughts we have, we feel so alone. Or when the depth of sin seems so great, something we've done, the mess we've got ourselves into, the patterns we can't shake off, and with them the shame and the guilt. No one would stick with me if they knew about it. And Jesus knows, so he can't still want me. For one reason or another, we find ourselves in situations which feel so dark, so bleak, and we can't imagine 
that there is any longer any hope for us with Jesus. Well, today, I want to reassure us that there is no depth of darkness too dark for Jesus. He is with us. He loves us and he will keep us safe. Because in the passage today, we come to Jesus' own darkest hour. And we see who he is in that moment and what he's like and what he's doing and ultimately how safe the disciples are through it all. As I said, this is the uh, new series in the final chapters of John's Gospel running through to Easter. If you know John's Gospel, um, uh, the first half of the Gospel, chapters 1 to 12, are, are covering three years of Jesus' ministry, all the miracles, all the teaching. The second half slows right down. Chapters 13 to 17 are five chapters just at the Lord's Supper, a, a much more detailed account uh, given in John's gospel than in the other gospels. Jesus telling his disciples about his death and his resurrection and his ascension and preparing them for the ministry that they will have afterwards. And the meal comes to an end and the hour has now come for Jesus to be arrested. And that's where we pick up today in chapter 18. My plan is to show you three things about Jesus each just briefly, but they'll build up to a fourth thing about how safe the disciples were with Jesus. That's what we're aiming for. Okay? So first, Jesus is in complete control. Verse 1, he finishes praying. The meal is over. They go out. They cross the valley and go into a garden. Verse 2, the garden chosen by Jesus is a favorite garden. It's one they've been to many times before. So it's one that Judas also knows. He'll guess that's where Jesus has gone. And that means Jesus is not hiding. If he was, he'd go somewhere completely different. Rather, it seems he wants to be found. Verse 3, Judas, the betrayer, comes with a mob. They've got torches and lanterns because it's dark and this is a dark moment they've come with torches to arrest the light of the world they've come with weapons of war to arrest the prince of peace But just as Judas knows where Jesus is and goes into the garden, Jesus knows where Judas is and goes out to him. And he takes the initiative. He's asking who they want twice, verse 4 and verse 7. He's leading the conversation and he just presents himself for arrest. He really isn't hiding from this moment. Rather, he's directing it all. He's, he's writing the script to the end that he's already decided on. It's clear that Jesus is in complete control. Which is strange because this is such a dark hour. The scheming of Judas and the priests and the Pharisees has all reached its climax. And, and they've got this overwhelming force of soldiers with them. This looks like their hour. This looks like the hour that Jesus is finally going to be overcome. But he's not. He's in complete control. Friends, please know that the arrest, the trial, and death of Jesus, which we'll be considering over the next few weeks, did not happen against Jesus' wishes. He was not taken against his will. He was not overcome by the powers of the day. He remained in control to the end. Maybe for people new to Christian things, maybe you, maybe you always thought, oh, it's sad that Jesus was got in the end. And if that's been your impression, please may I correct it. He went of his own accord. And for all of us, 
see that Jesus is never surprised by anything. He's never caught out then or now or wherever we find ourselves. He knows already what is happening and that's got to be a comfort to us. That's the first thing to see, but let's see the next thing about Jesus, still building up to that point about our safety. Secondly, Jesus is the Lord of glory. Look at these interactions with those who've come to arrest him. Verse 4, who is it you want? Verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth, I am he, Jesus said. And then verse 6, they draw back and fall to the ground. What's that about? I think there's something here about the words Jesus says and the way in which he says them. First, on the words he uses, he says, I am he. Or literally, I am. The he is added in English to make sort of sense of the sentence. Uh, he says, I am. And those words have huge meaning in the Bible. Even though they're just a, a simple pairing of words, they're very significant. And we know this in English, don't we? Even just sort of simple words uh, paired together can have sort of much more significance. Uh, if you say to me, to be or not to be, you could randomly have said that, but I'd guess you're quoting Shakespeare. Or if you said, uh, uh, just do it, you're referring to Nike, or I'm loving it, you're referring to McDonald's. I am is a reference to something. I am is God's name for himself. It comes in Exodus chapter 3. Students in 20s and 30s here, we've been studying Exodus this term. You should have been well ahead of us on this already. Um, in, in Exodus 3, Moses is speaking to God himself in the, in the glorious burning bush and asks what his name is, and God says, I am who I am, or I am for short. So when Jesus says, I am, he is answering their question and saying he's Jesus of Nazareth, but he's doing so by using the name of God for himself. Now, it's not actually the first time Jesus has done this in John's gospel. He's done it subtly seven times before this. And you'll know those times. It's each time he's said something like, I am the bread of life, or I am the light of the world, or I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's done it seven times subtly, but he's done it once explicitly already as well. At the very end of chapter 8, he's in an argument with the Jewish leaders about various things, including if he's more important than Abraham or not. And he says this, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And they went absolutely ballistic at that moment because they'd understood what he tried to do, what he was saying, and they tried to stone him. So then here, he does the same thing. He makes that explicit claim, but this time they don't try and stone him. They fall back and stumble to the ground. This time he must have said it differently. As he spoke, he must have shown some of the force of his glory. He claims the name of the Lord and at the same time displays some of his hidden glory. And they fall back. We could talk for hours on this. But can you just see that it makes sense of his control? No ordinary person could dictate the circumstances so easily and, and lead things so naturally and speak so assuredly. This man being arrested really is the Lord of glory. I hope for Christians that is no surprise. Maybe visitors are raising an eyebrow at this though. But it's absolutely essential for our understanding of Jesus. He's not just a man, he's the Lord of glory. 
And then it's not just a man being arrested and tried and killed. It's the Lord of glory being arrested, tried and killed. And that is much more remarkable. So then third, Jesus sacrifices himself. If Jesus is in complete control and the Lord of glory, there's no need for him to be arrested and killed. He could have easily avoided it. With a few words, he could have calmed everyone down, uh, wrapped it all up, sent everyone back, and before we know it, everyone's in bed for a good night's sleep. Or he could have done whatever else he wanted, couldn't he? He could have said, right, let's all go on holiday. Let's go to the Mediterranean. Let's go surfing. It's evident that Jesus was deliberately giving himself up, sacrificing himself. The end of the passage makes sense of this, verse 10. Peter wants to fight, he swings his sword, he cuts off the servant's ear, Jesus stops him. In the other Gospels, we're told that Jesus heals the servant, but here we focus just on Jesus' comment. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? That line, along with the closing one in verse 14, makes it clear that Jesus is giving himself as a sacrifice. Verse 12, he's led away, he's bound, his physical abuse begins. They take him to the high priests. And John reminds us of the prophecy that Caiaphas had made back in chapter 12. At that point, Caiaphas was arguing for why they should kill Jesus But John interprets it as a prophecy for the cross. He says it would be good if one man died for the people. Jesus is not dying because they've overcome him and they want to put an end to him. Jesus is dying because he's choosing to drink the cup that the Father has given him in place of all his people. The cup is the cup of the wrath of God. It's an Old Testament picture. To drink the cup is to take the judgment of God on yourself, to die experiencing the punishment for sin. And it should be all people taking it. It should be our cup. But Jesus thought that it was good for him one perfect man, the Lord of glory, to drink it, to die for us all. That cup was set before us at our place at the table. But Jesus takes our terrible place and he drinks that terrible cup. This is the heart of the gospel. And it's too wonderful for us to comprehend the Lord of glory who controls all things, who has the power of creation in his hands. And he does not use that power or control for his own exaltation. He he didn't preserve a life of safety. He didn't seek a life of comfortable luxury as we would. He set it aside and went to the cross. He experienced the agony of crucifixion. And the unbearable anguish of the punishment of God. He bore the wrath. He drank the cup to its dregs. So that we don't have to. Friends, with any dose of honest self-reflection, we'll admit that we know our own sins. We know the magnitude of them. Sometimes we break down in tears because of them. But do we know the magnitude of Jesus' love for us that he would bear our sins himself? So first, Jesus is in complete control. Second, Jesus is the Lord of glory. Third, Jesus sacrifices himself, a remarkable trio of truths. But look what this means for his followers. Fourth, the disciples are completely safe. We 
are completely safe. Not a hair on the heads of the disciples is harmed at any point. Verse 1, they're with him as he crosses the Kidron Valley. They go with him into the garden. He leads them into the place of darkness. The mob come to get him. They have an overwhelming force of soldiers. You'd think they would round up the disciples as well. Belt and braces approach. Get them all. Better safe than sorry. The Romans have never been ones for due process. But Jesus will not let them be touched. Verse 4, he asks, who do you want? I guess that means me or them. And he presents himself so that there's no confusion. Twice it happens, and he insists that they take him, not them. Verse 8, if you're looking for me, then let these men go. And they do, they just do. And nothing ever happens to them. Doesn't that seem unlikely? They are untouched all the way through until Jesus comes back after his resurrection. Because this is what he said would happen. Verse 9, referring back to declarations he'd made in chapter 6 and in chapter 10, he would not lose one of those the Father gave him. They will be perfectly safe. Now, if I don't explain this a bit more, we could come away with the presumption that nothing bad will ever happen to those who believe in Jesus. No sickness, no persecution, no dark thoughts. And then when those things happen to you, you'll think that I lied or Jesus lied and you'll give up your faith. So let me say a little bit more on this. Bad stuff did later happen to the disciples after Jesus returned to heaven. They were all arrested. Some of them were flogged. Most of them executed. They had times of grief and sorrow, even times of doubt and uncertainty. They were led into some very dark situations, but they were protected from evil. Spiritual protection rather than physical protection. Because you see, there are evil forces who fight against Jesus and his people, the prince of this world, Satan, and his evil servants. And they work through the mob, the mob arresting Jesus and the mobs that attack Christians. We don't forget the many persecuted Christians around the world. There is great fear for many, stirred up by the evil one. As well, we're attacked in our minds, with the shame of sin and the weight of guilt and the doubts and the dark thoughts, the devil wants to bring us down. One way or another, he wants to take us from the hands of Jesus. But Jesus will keep us safe. He will hold us fast. This remarkable physical protection of the disciples is a picture of the absolute safety we have with him from all the forces of evil against us, the spiritual attacks we face. The biblical picture is one of a shepherd with his sheep. We see a lot of sheep in the Peak District, don't we? The lambs are out. I saw lambs yesterday. Uh, what we don't often see are the shepherds. I don't know why the shepherds, we, we don't really get shepherds sort of around anymore. But um, uh, we, we can be reminded of them and we, we remember their role. We can imagine back to what they would have been like. The shepherds there with their sheep in the field, alongside them, knowing each one, caring for them, delivering the lambs, seeing if one is sick, untangling them when they're caught in the brambles, and fighting off the wolves which attack them. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd who goes above and beyond, who's even willing to die to protect his sheep. He did that. 
And his protection continues so that we are safe no matter what attack comes. So how dark would things have to be for Jesus not to be able to keep us safe? The answer is there is no darkness so dark that he's not protecting us. The sorrows, the tragedies, the things we feel we cannot bear anymore. Jesus is near. Pray to him. Talk to him. He's not caught out by this. Express how you're feeling to him. Reiterate your trust in him and he will see you through. You'll see the light again. Or the depth of our sin, when we feel no one would stand with us if they knew, well, Jesus doesn't turn his face away. He washes us clean. You see, he knows our sin already. He knew it completely when he was on the cross bearing it. He loved you then and he still loves you now. So confess it all and bring it into the light. And facing our own death, each one of us one day, some of us know it's too soon. What does the great psalm say? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. He is our shepherd. So set your eyes on Jesus, the eyes of faith, because it's only a matter of time until you see him physically, face to face. He'll hold you tight and see you through. The darkness will pass and you'll come safely into the light of his glory forever. We are completely safe with Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you very, very much for Jesus, our great shepherd who looks after us, who sees us through, who's overcome all things for us. Thank you that he bore our sin on the cross and how he shepherds us through all our life. So for any of us who are feeling like we're in the darkness now, please, Lord, might we have that comfort in Jesus that we need today. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a couple of songs singing about Jesus, our servant king. Let's stand and sing.
please take your seats. Well, it's been really good to be gathered together this morning um, to consider Christ and his commitment to us and um, the way that he will bring us safely home to him. And uh, as we uh, come to the end of our sort of structured time together, um, I'm going to highlight another upcoming opportunity to gather together and consider Christ. Um, This is on Monday, Thursday, uh, the 28th of March. We're going to have an agape meal. Um, So that's going to begin at 7.30. It'll be a great opportunity to gather for some food and fellowship and uh, to set our minds together um, on that first Easter weekend. Um, You can sign up to that now to come along. Um, There's a QR code there, and I think there might be some flyers at the back. And it would really help the office team if you could could do that and sign up if you're going to come. Um, Also, just to say again that uh, if you're new here and you'd like to find out a bit more about getting involved in church, there's a newcomer welcome card. Um, I should have brought one up the front with me, but there are some at the back. There are little white ones, um, and you can fill those in um, and hand them to me or to Matt. Um, Yep, I'm going to draw us uh, together for one last final prayer. And uh, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his uh, great commitment to um, us, uh, that he was willing to walk the road of suffering uh, in our place and die on the cross. And thank you um, for the way that that shows us uh, that we are safe with him through all of the ups and downs of life to come. And we pray that in the week ahead that you would strengthen us uh, with the knowledge um, that you've taught us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Well, if you'd like to stick around, there's tea and coffee over in the church centre. Thanks. Have a good day. Yeah, God.